Hi, I'm Jessica from Tudor Time Machine. Before we start the next episode, I wanted to let you know that we have some holiday Tudor Time Machine merch, only available until December 31st. Give a unique gift and support the podcast. And don't forget to treat yourself too. Declare your interest and your style. Go to our Facebook page and hit the Shop Now button to see our Tudorific designs. Don't miss these items and enjoy this episode of the Tudor Time Machine podcast. Hey ho, Tudor minded people. I'm Gage. I'm Jessica. We're Tudor Time Machine, and this is episode 39 of our podcast. Thank you for joining us. If you're new here, it's best to start at episode one. This is a story project and it goes in order. We're so excited to be reaching thousands of Tudor minded people from all over the world. And we've had such a great time researching and imagining this project and especially bringing it to you. And if you're enjoying it, support us. Buy some great Tudor Time Machine swag. Indeed, go to our Tudor Time Machine Facebook page, hit the Shop Now button, and you'll see all the great stuff we have for sale. Get a Do You Tudor tee or a sweatshirt and support the podcast at the same time. In our last episode, Philomena and Constance devised a stratagem to get Francis Darrell to London. Now we're going to 1532 to join Margaret as she visits her brother in his Away From Court digs. After the reading, we will have some fun discussing the history beyond our tale and making connections between then and now. Read on, Jesse. Chapter 39, 1532, The Rooms of Sir Thomas Wyatt, in which Margaret finds Thomas in languor and lights the fire of ambition under his arse. Margaret knew an inn was the proper place for her brother to spend his idle time. At court his pride and temper could lead to deadly mischief, and Allington Castle, with his whorish wife, was a jail for his soul. The inn provided companions who would not have his head for a misplaced jest, and if she had to seek him out, let it be here. The little dark squalid rooms at court that he shared with five of his pages made her skin crawl. The rooms Thomas had taken in the city were the best. He could not afford them, but that did not deter. Three spacious wood-panelled chambers with windows, furnished with turkey carpets and cushioned chairs, a canopy bed with long velvet bed curtains, a writing desk upon an inlaid table, and a hearth in every room. It had all been very pleasant, until his untidy habits ruined the place. Margaret stepped off the small stairs and opened her brother's door, the expected mess. The papers that lay about with their half-written poems and abandoned reflections, those were charming. The thing Margaret disliked was the artifice. A glove, a hairpiece, a coif left by one lady or another, shoved into a half-closed drawer as if in secret, when in fact Thomas wanted every man to envy and every woman to smell his sexual prowess. The pools of tallow, the ink-stained desk, his dirty goblets, slovenly. Their mother would swoon. Did this disarray impress the ladies, convince them of his freedom of spirit, and drive them to his bed? Or did he play to their vanity of the power of the feminine touch to reform begrimed ways? He had servants enough to keep order if he gave them leave. She pulled aside the bed curtains, a lump in the bed. She measured it in her mind. It was one not to. Margaret, I can hear you and smell you and feel your eyes on me, he rolled over. You come again to ruin my slumber. Sitting on the bed beside him, she smoothed her skirt. A drunken hiccup so early in the morning? Answer a riddle for me. Is it a good one? No. Well, go ahead. Who has sent me, brother? Oh, zoons, as if I should lose sleep over that. Who is it? That shit of a tailor? I told him I was not going to pay for such work. Why did he say such things? He knew who sent her and why she was there, but she would play along. You wore the doublet he made last night to court. It would be sinful to discard it. Your code of honour is a muddle, Thomas, but I am not here from a creditor. Who else cares for me? Is it a printer, a lady, an admirer? A friend you know well, he raised his eyebrows. The kind who demands what they want. Stop insulting your friend. It is the king himself, as well you know. She watched as her brother closed his eyes. He is a friend as a bear is to a lover. That is a poor metaphor. It is a simile. The king cannot show friendship. Desire, power, and suspicion make a brew that leaves him addled. He shows friendship often, pox on it. How overwrought you are. 
We shall go to Calais, you and I and the king and most of Henry's court. And the Lady Anne? Margaret could not believe he still said the name with such emotion. Do not pretend you do not know. This expedition has been planned for a long time. I hear Anne will not go because the French queen sees her as the king's whore and will not receive her. She will go and another lady will receive her. Ah, the whore of France shall receive the whore of England. Your tongue is a nasty thing. Anne shall go and who knows how it will turn. She may have her way and the French queen will receive her. And, my pout, it is nothing to do with you. You must go. I hoped that if I ignored the plans you would drift off without me. What call have I to go for the pleasure of seeing that arrogant prick, King Francis, to watch these royal brothers embrace and fawn with fratricide in their hearts? With you and Cromwell to hound me and the King and Anne to nuzzle before me? A fine, tormenting trip. Why do I not leap from my bed onto my horse? Margaret knew he had to come. He could not deny the King. Her brother hated to feel that he was a subject, but such was the lot of every member of the kingdom, save one, Anne Boleyn herself. A sad day is a day without complete self-indulgence. But I do not fear for you. You will find novelty on the trip. I am sure you will spring your poetry and find a bedtime friend in Calais. You shall find it more enjoyable than you anticipate. Sitting up, he crossed his arms on his chest. Why do you begrudge me? Other men use my verses for the same purpose, and they did not even write the words. You are married. You follow a well-trod path. You, on the other hand, dislike your wife and have brief encounters with pleasing girls. No man before you has ever done such a thing. Margaret walked over to one of the sleeves hanging out of a drawer. This is beautiful. Is that a pearl at the wrist? La, la, I underrate you, brother. Was her husband coming that she left it behind? Perhaps she will let you buy it from her. Margaret could not resist lifting it out. The colour was unusual, a saffron yellow. I do not want to know who the owner of this is, but you must send it to her, for you must get out of bed after I leave. I do not want to know how you are clad under there, and you must bring a waist. Sister. Oh, heaven, she thought, his sincere voice. He was going to make a weighty appeal. Anne. And with the king, my lungs contract and expectorate, freeze and fill with ice. You are a tragedian. It has been four years since you have looked on Anne as your own, and you are still full of wind. Is this act a final manoeuvre to evade going overseas? He made a soft face. Thomas, I am your sister. I have seen it before. You think my heart is numb? that you have seen me laugh with her at a dance or pass her by in the garden. But that show of disinterest is not due to feelings lack. It is something very different. It is the might of a man conquering himself. You are a love warrior. You know nothing. If it were not for her brother's rivalry with the king, Margaret thought, Thomas would have forgotten Anne and his travels. So many women were desperate to duel the poet and have him draw his sword. Many ladies have enjoyed your wit since our Anne did. It has been a time of quantity, but little quality. Let me pluck on my lute a sympathetic song, but now you must accompany the king and Anne. It will prove to the king that your infatuation is ended. And what duty you may show the king. The French ambassador knows you well and would call you his friend. Only in a diplomatic meeting, and the French fop knows Anne the better. What a peacock you are. The king desires you. You are his man. You shall go. With our Anne Boleyn, Marquis of Pembroke. He looked at Margaret as if he would damn her to hell. A little guilt flittered through Margaret's mind. She knew Anne was not so easily forgotten, but she could not admit Anne's place in her brother's heart. That would only fan the flames. Ah, Marquis of Pembroke, how the title rankles me, he said. Because she climbed faster than you. She knows she needs the king as you do. Will you have him force you to reunite with your wife? Seize the few lands left to you? Doubt your loyalty? The king is the butter if you desire to eat bread. I do not need him to shine my way. Oh, yes, brother, you do. He slumped his acquiescence. Will your husband ever win an argument with you? He shall believe to win them all. Do me the same favour. I like to believe I am winning. The last time we saw Margaret and Thomas, 
it was 1527. In this chapter, it's 1532, so a lot has changed in five years. Wyatt asks Margaret if her husband ever wins an argument with her. Yes, our Margaret is now a married woman. In about 1530, 1531, Margaret married Sir Anthony Lee of Quarrenden in Buckinghamshire. So Anthony Lee was a courtier in Henry's court who later became a member of Parliament. It's reported that he was in the household of Sir Thomas Cromwell. And given how incredibly influential Cromwell is at this time, it's a very good household to be in. We've discussed this before in other episodes, but it's worth repeating how connected the Wyatts were to Cromwell and how natural it would have been for Margaret to make a union with someone in Thomas Cromwell's household. Yes, the connection goes back to Margaret and Thomas Wyatt's father, Sir Henry, who was a friend of Cromwell's. And after that, Cromwell takes on being a very important patron to our poet, and he helps advance him at court and also lends him money. Thomas Cromwell also protected Wyatt in two very serious instances when Thomas Wyatt was imprisoned in the tower. But that will come later in our story. Oh, you're building suspense there, are you? Yes. So Margaret's husband, Sir Anthony, was also close to Thomas. In fact, Wyatt wrote that Lee had done him so many favors that it made him weary to think on them. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) You're doing me favors. It makes me so tired. (laughs) So many of those favors were also in the financial line. So I have to think that Lee was also weary to think on how much money he lent his brother-in-law. Wyatt was not good at balancing his accounts. No. And in our story, that's a fault that Margaret is really concerned about. And she's also concerned that Wyatt wears his heart on his sleeve when it comes to Anne Boleyn. That's dangerous. And he's also neglecting his relationship to the king. And that's dangerous. She's completely right to worry. Being in favor with the king, working to keep that favor, subverting any personal feelings against Henry, that is the only way to rise at court. Not just to rise, but to survive there. Thomas is only gentry. He is not a rich peer of the realm who can throw his weight around and neglect the king, you know, storm away from court and return to his estate to live on his rents. No, he's lowly gentry. He needs the king. And by 1532, things have really progressed between Anne and Henry. And it's at the point where Margaret considers it just absurd for her brother to have any thoughts of Anne. So the last time we saw Thomas, he was setting out on a journey to Rome along with the Earl of Bedford to sound out Pope Clement on the validity of Henry's marriage to Catherine of Aragon. So Henry's position was that Clement's predecessor, Pope Leo, should never have given him and Catherine the dispensation to marry back in 1509 because of Catherine's previous marriage to his brother. And in 1509, Catherine maintained that the marriage to Arthur had never been consummated and that there was not a problem with her marrying Henry. When Henry sounded out Pope Clement in 1527, the Pope maintains that Leo had been correct to give the dispensation. Because as we talked about in a previous episode, it wasn't as if Henry started out by demanding this annulment. He sort of played this game of, well, I haven't had a son, so I think God might be mad at me. What do you think, Pope Clement? And then Pope Clement said, oh, no, I think that's not the reason why you're not having any sons. So Henry didn't get the satisfaction he wanted from Pope Clement. Then he suggests to Catherine that God is angry at them and that it might be best for Catherine to retire to a nunnery like a good girl. But this proud princess of Spain and queen of England for the last 20 years said, quote, God never called me to a nunnery. I am the king's true and legitimate wife. She just wasn't going to go out like that. Henry got his main man, Cardinal Wolsey, on the case. But remember, Wolsey was the Pope's legate, or his representative in England. So that meant that technically the Pope was Wolsey's boss, not Henry. At this time, in the great chain of being, the Pope is the top of the line. And it was in Wolsey's interest to keep a good relationship with Rome, even as he tried to do the king's bidding. And I don't think Wolsey had any idea that it would come to Henry breaking with Rome and setting himself up as the head of the English church. No, I mean, there had obviously been problems between the popes and kings and schisms and things. But 
I think the idea that Henry would set himself up as the head of his own church would have been inconceivable in, at this point. So Woolsey tries to do what's asked of him. He argues that the original 1509 dispensation was void because it was incorrectly worded. So that's a typical lawyerly opening move. Argue what's on paper, right? A technicality. A technicality. But a correctly worded copy was found in Spain, and it was determined to be the original, so that failed. So then, Woolsey, in 1528, tries another tactic. He proposes that an ecclesiastical court with the king and Catherine in attendance be convened in England to determine the validity of the dispensation, and that there are two questions to determine. First, in the Christian religion, is it forbidden to marry your brother's widow? I would just want to add Woolsey's desire, Woolsey's object in all of this at this moment was to try to keep this case in England because he knew he could control it in England. And if it goes to Rome, then he's in trouble. There were actually two answers to this question of, is it biblically okay to marry your brother's widow. Both are found in the Old Testament, which is also called the Hebrew Bible. In the book of Leviticus, it's prohibited to marry your brother's widow, but in the book of Deuteronomy, it's encouraged to marry your brother's widow. As Leviticus is the third book of the Hebrew Bible, and Deuteronomy is the fifth book, <laughs> some people made the argument that Deuteronomy being the more recent on this kind of made-up timeline, <laughs> both books are supposed to have been written somewhere between 500 and 300 BCE and either compiled or written by the Jewish prophet Moses. So who really knows what True. the timeline <laughs> is? But technically, Deuteronomy is considered Moses' last instructions to his people. In that case, Deuteronomy trumps Leviticus. Period. Done. Bam. But... <laughs> Henry ignored it anyway, of course. and he kept doing what served him, so no marrying your brother's widow. The other question at Wolsey's court was whether Catherine was at worst lying, or at best mistaken, that her marriage to Arthur was not consummated. It's kind of a weird question. How could she be mistaken about that? Especially, she's a 40-year-old woman, she's been married for 20 years, She's had many pregnancies, many miscarriages. She knows what sex looks and feels like. <laughs> she knows what's happening. With the king or with his brother. And Catherine's position about this Leviticus Deuteronomy question was that whatever you choose to believe about the biblical instructions about marrying or not marrying your brother's widow made no difference because she never consummated her marriage to Prince Arthur. And therefore, it was not a marriage. And at this point in history, a marriage has to be consummated to be valid. It must have been embarrassing for Catherine to have to prove in front of this court of men that she knew when she was having sex or not having sex. I know. And we try to imagine what that must have been like for her. It must have been just horrible. I also have to think that when sex was such a legal matter, I mean, that it sealed a marriage and that it was a matter of state in the sense of getting an heir. Perhaps in this context, people were less uptight about discussing the technicalities of sex because it was sort of legal and political as well as being personal. Well, that's true. Maybe that's our presentism. We consider sex a completely personal matter. It's just you yourself. But the Tudors did not. It's a state matter. When after the marriage, you hang up the bloody sheet, right? Yes. So everybody in the community can see that you consummated the marriage and that you're married. The whole proceedings must have blindsided Catherine, not, not just the questions about sex. I mean, to be defending her marriage after 20 plus years of being the Queen of England. So this court would be presided over by Wolves himself, and another papal legate nominated by the Pope. The Pope kind of, but not really, agreed to this, but he did dispatch his legate, Lorenzo Campeggio, to England. He was like, hey, Lorenzo, you know, take your time getting to Henry's court, stop and smell the roses, yeah, take the slow road, if you know what I mean, you know, don't hurry. <laughs> there were lots of delays in starting the court, and procedural delays once Campeggio got there. Campeggio made procedural delays because he kind of knew his mission was to delay this as much as possible. And if, if he could humanly do it, move it to Rome. The Pope and Campeggio did not want it decided in England. So Catherine had the original papal bull from 1509 in her possession. So she showed it to him and he, and he said, well, 
That looks pretty good to me. <laughs> yeah, it looks pretty binding. And Catherine absolutely fought for herself when she was brought before the court, and she made three essential arguments. So the first was that she had to be judged by men who were her peers, so royal in other words. Otherwise, it violated the great chain of being. And the second one was that she insisted that the marriage to Arthur was unconsummated and therefore not a marriage. And her third argument was that the proceedings had to be heard before the Pope because in the great chain of being, he is the only person who is in the position to make decisions about a royal marriage. And the Pope saw the sense in what Catherine was saying. And in 1529, he recalled Compeggio, and he actually ordered Henry to get his kingly ass over to Rome and not to think about making a second marriage because he, Mr. Pope, in the Vatican, was the decider. But we don't want to give the idea that it was just Catherine's excellent argument. No, no, no. The Pope <laughs> had other reasons, yeah. right? So the Pope is not sort of driven by justice. He was getting a lot of heat from Catherine's nephew, the incredibly powerful Charles V of Spain and Holy Roman Emperor. We've talked in previous episodes about the Italian wars and the sack of Rome in 1527 by Charles's forces. And Charles still at this point is holding the Pope captive. The Pope can't afford to make Charles V even more angry at him. And Catherine herself is adding pressure to Charles. She writes him, my tribulations are so great, my life so disturbed by the plans daily invented to further the king's wicked intentions. Yeah, she calls it the king's wicked intention. She's placing blame directly on the king. She's not pretending that it's just sort of happening. It's, it's Henry. He's, he is doing this to her. She does. And she doesn't name, you know, Woolsey. She doesn't name Cromwell. What she writes is, The surprises which the king gives me with certain persons of his council are so mortal, and my treatment is what God knows. That is enough to shorten ten lives, much more mine. And she doesn't say, oh, the poor king is so confused about this issue of Deuteronomy and Leviticus. <laughs> she sees what's going on. She knows that the king is using these things to get an annulment from her. Besides the pressures from Charles V, I'm very sure that the Pope didn't want to start making a habit of second-guessing the papal bulls of predecessors because that would be a dangerous precedent. It might open the door for wrangling over other previous bulls, and he just didn't want to do that. Then as now, the church does not like to reassess past decisions. No institution does no. because it makes a big headache. <laughs> This was bad news for Wolsey. His failure to make the situation come out the way Henry wanted pretty much sealed his downfall. Wolsey was no friend to Anne, and it seems that she and her supporters laid into Wolsey for the slow proceedings of the court. They convinced the king that Wolsey did it on purpose, and that even though Wolsey had served him loyally for 14 years, Henry turned against him, and Henry did that. He turned against Catherine. He turned against Sir Thomas More, turned against Anne, he turned against Cromwell. He turned against people who were the most loyal to him. Yes, but Anne and her supporters also fed into Henry's ego. Wolsey was very, very powerful, and he was very wealthy. And they suggested to Henry that Wolsey was above the king. And, you know, Henry was very, very sensitive to that. He didn't like it. And in 1529, Wolsey was stripped of all his offices and his property. Lucky Henry got the <laughs> magnificent mid-16th century architectural show place. Yes. yes. Hampton Court. And also a lot of other goodies. And Wolsey was only allowed to retain one title, the Archbishop of York. Wolsey saw that the court was getting too hot for him and he hightailed it to York, but mid-trip he was arrested for treason, which is Henry's catch-all charge, and Wolsey was commanded back to court. But Wolsey took his time getting back and fell sick and made the excuse that he could not come back because he was sick, but Henry sent him another message saying, you better get here. But fortunately for Woolsey, he died, and he spent his final hours in the relative comfort of a bed and saving himself from the horror of a trial and having his head chopped off in front of gleeful enemies. And he made a lot of them in his dozen-plus years of being chancellor. I read that Woolsey had more real power than any other servant of the crown 
in English history before or after the Tudor period, way more than Cromwell ever did, even though you often see Cromwell cited as Henry's most influential and important counselor. So Anne was one of those who was very happy to see Wolsey go. The proceeding against the king's marriage to Catherine just went into high gear because the new man running the show, Cromwell, was a religious reformer. Actually, it wouldn't have served Cromwell or Henry to really be Lutherans at this point either because when Martin Luther was questioned on the marriage to Catherine, he said, even if there should be a divorce, Catherine will remain Queen of England and she will have been wronged before God and man. No, my friend, if you are bound to a woman, you are no longer a free man. God forces you to stay with wife and child, to feed and rear them. Cromwell may have had some reformer sympathies. But he was not a fanatic adherent to any religion. No, he was Mr. Pragmatic. And that's just what Henry needed in 1530, because let's face it, his long marriage to Catherine was legal and binding by any standards, legal or religious. But it's good to be king, because you can always find a way. That's right. Henry did not (laughs) give up. He went around the Pope, and hearing of an ordained priest, Thomas Cranmer, with reforming tendencies and some very interesting ideas on papal authorities. Such as that a king and not a pope should be the ultimate judge of religious matters in his own kingdom. Henry made Cranmer his representative to canvas church figures from universities all over Europe on his marriage. Then in 1532, the Archbishop of Canterbury, William Warham, died and blam, Cranmer, very young, never really having held any important church offices, he was made Archbishop of Canterbury because Henry liked him immediately. Yes, absolutely. (laughs) And remember, England has not broken from Rome yet, so the Pope still has to decide all these church matters. But he okays the title of Archbishop of Canterbury, the most important church office in England, passing to Thomas Cranmer, because the Pope hopes that act may soothe tensions with England and solve these problems he's having with Henry. So he doesn't foresee that making Cranmer the top church authority in England will guarantee Henry's annulment. So it's kind of a bad move by the Pope. It's an, yeah. So Catherine was kicked out of her royal apartments. She's banished from court. And she initially went to Moore Palace in Hertfordshire, which was once a residence of Cardinal Wolsey's. Anne is installed in Catherine's royal rooms and elevated to the title of Marquess of Pembroke, sometimes styled Lady Marquess of Pembroke. And that title was created for Anne. And interestingly, it gave her lands which were mostly in Wales, which was significant because that is the home of the Tudor line. And it's also interesting because Henry, in the documents that accompanied this title, omitted the normal condition that the title could only be passed to legitimate heirs. Because again, he's, he was covering all the bases. If the marriage with Anne did not finally come to pass, he would potentially have a male heir with this nice title of Marquess of Pembroke, and that might come in handy if he needed to pass his kingdom to an illegitimate son that he might have with Anne. But the title died with Anne. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's in the future. Nobody could foresee that. Yes. It's the fall of 1532. Anne is feeling very confident. Henry is contemplating this final break with Rome, placing all the decisions for church matters, including his annulment in the hands of the English church authorities, with himself as their head and his new Archbishop of Canterbury second to him. And lucky Anne has the nicest room at court, with a new fancy title. So Henry decided it might be a good time to try to get some other European monarchs on his side in this annulment issue. So Charles V is out, of course. Henry decides he will arrange a diplomatic trip to France. He hoped that King Francis would support Anne because Anne spent so many years at his court in the service of his wife, Queen Claude. And also France, though a Catholic country, has always been an enemy of Charles V and of Spain. So Francis agreed to the trip, but there was a big issue. Queen Claude had died in 1524, and Francis had a new queen, Eleanor of Austria. 
who was born in Spain, Anna Habsburg, and... Yes, sister to Charles V, and herself niece to Queen Catherine of England. Those Habsburgs get around. Yeah, they sure did. And Queen Eleanor refused to receive Anne because Anne was not Queen of England. Henry was doing everything he could to raise Anne's status, but outside of England, she was just considered the English king's mistress and nothing more. The precedent was that you had to meet your equal. You couldn't meet the king's mistress on an official trip. It's true, and it's suggested that Francis's mistress could receive Anne, but that was absolutely rejected by Henry and Anne. Right. They were insulted. And all these (laughs) etiquette crises and the Pope's issues and Charles V's issues and Francis's issues and Queen Eleanor of Austria and Catherine of Aragon, they have no bearing on the fact that Margaret just wants her brother Thomas to get his act together, to make nice with the king, and to get his ass out of bed and get packed to go to Calais. So we will follow this court field trip to see how it all goes down. But in our next episode, we're going to spend Valentine's Day with Philomena and Constance. Yes, we'll have a little break from the religious situation (laughs) in England. (laughs) So join us next time for more Time's Riddle and more Tudor-minded talk.